Uh, it was a partly sunny day when, not the day I was born, but when Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Mielisek came to my office and uh, asked me to give the last lecture, I readily accepted, as Dr. Kaplan said. But as soon as I accepted it, my anxiety started going through the roof. You got to understand, I'm a very introverted person. So although you might think that I'm here in front of all of you, I must not be introverted. But I started getting a lot, lot of anxiety in myself. My partly sunny day suddenly changed into a partly cloudy day. So I was thinking that I got 99 problems, and this wasn't supposed to be one of them. <laughs> so here I am. So then that night, uh, I started looking at uh, who had given the last lecture before me. And then I said, uh, saw Dr. Johnny Alreddy, Bill Baker, Christian Wells, Barbara Cruz, and my partly cloudy day became a dark, stormy night. <laughs> but I'm here now. So there's no going back for me as well as you. So stay here, and let's see what we have to say. But before I say anything, I do want to thank Dr. Kaplan and Mr. Bowers, who's right there on the camera there, for all the back and forth we went in order to get this all set up. Uh, it has been quite a feat on both of your part. Please accept my gratitude for that. And thank you for the student affairs and the <laughs> Housing and Residential Education Office for making this possible, for sponsoring this event. I also want to thank the University Marketing, Communications and Marketing Department, uh, Mark Shiner of WUSF, Janet Gillis of College of Engineering, uh, and my own, our own staff in mechanical engineering to making this possible in terms of giving the publicity to this particular lecture. Let me spend a few moments on where I am from, and I get asked this question quite a number of times. So I want to tell you my narrative, because narrative means that there's a compilation of stories here. The first one which I want to tell you about my family where I grew up because many times when, I when people ask me where I'm from, I say, I'm from Tampa. They don't believe me at all. <laughs> so this is my father, and that's my mother. And you got to see that these are two good-looking guys, so something good has to come out of that, right? <laughs> and this is what came out. <laughs> <laughs> my father was a very honest man in a country where bribery and corruption is prevalent. It's as if it's democratized, just like the democracy itself in India. He never took a bribe, never received a bribe. So it was very hard for him to be, to be a public school teacher. You're working for the government. If you're not taking bribes, you're not giving bribes, what you got to do is you got to send this guy to a remote place so that he gets out of your hair. So half of his tenure was all in the remote places of Jammu and Kashmir in India. And so, but he wanted the base to be just in the, in the city which I was born in, which was Srinagar, Kashmir. And so mom stayed with us and raised uh, the kids while he would go to these places which would be far away from our home base. He couldn't come back every day to be able to see us. So it was, a, it was a quite, a, quite a hard living in that respect because uh, he would be away. And since he didn't take bribes, didn't, uh, didn't give bribes, so we didn't have a whole lot of money. So we led a very much a low middle class life uh, when we were growing up. Uh, but but that's, uh, that's okay, because uh, we had almost everything we needed if we didn't have everything which we wanted. But uh, that worked out pretty fine. So this is my place of birth. And I'm giving you a reductive story right here about my place of birth, because it's about two, two miles away from where I was born. This is the Dull Lake, and behind there is the Himalayan Range. So it's amazing that uh, right at your doorstep, you have the Himalayan Rage. You can see it from your house. But when you see it every day, it, it becomes second nature to you. But that's, but that's the kind of neighborhood I lived in. So that's the non-reductive part of my story right here. So people might think that, hey, um, this is a harsh living. But um, many other people live like that. So I didn't know any better. There were some privileged few in our city when we were living. But that was OK. So you always try to compare with what other people have in terms of trying to see that, hey, uh, how, how well your life is or how good or bad your life is. I don't have any pictures of uh, homes uh, where we lived in uh, because twice uh, in the last century, uh, my family had to flee. 
for the first time, it was 1948. This was one year after India gained independence from Britain. And Kashmir, the state which I live in, which I lived my life, was then an independent nation. It was a monarchy at that time. So Pakistan, which was our neighboring country, sent a proxy army into Kashmir because they didn't want to send their own army into Kashmir to annex it. Uh, because that would not look good. We had been just independent for one year, both India and Pakistan itself. So my uh, family, which was leading a very good prosperous life at that time in 1947, I was not born then. They had to move into the city at that time. So we lost everything at that time as well. And then what happened was uh, uh, in 1990, again, we were having some internal conflicts uh, in, uh, since 1989 or so. The uh, Soviet-Afghanistan war had just ended, so the Mujahideen, the independence fighters from Pakistan and Afghanistan had to go somewhere. So they wanted to come to Kashmir to be, in order to be able to save Kashmir for one reason or the another. On August 24, 1990, my father was killed for the sole reason of being a Hindu. And they had to flee. My mother and sister had to flee on the very same day. In 19... 76, at the age of 16, I went to my undergraduate institution. I went to the College of Engineering called Bits Pilani. So you might think that uh, I'm 16 years old, so I must be some kind of a prodigy. Far from it, uh, because in those days, people went to school after 11th grade. You went to college after 11th grade as opposed to 12th grade. And we went to a five-year engineering college, which many of you are familiar with at USF also, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, so here I am going out of state for the first time riding a train for the first time, and all these things are coming to me like, like a storm. I have never been exposed to all these things before I, went to, before I went to college. So I'm there for one week. One week I'm there. On a Saturday night, I run away. I run away back to New Delhi. And the reason why I run back to New Delhi is because that's where my mom is visiting my brother, visiting her brother, my uncle, at that time. Although we lived about maybe seven, 800 miles away, but uh, New Delhi was just a six-hour bus ride from the place where I had gone for my undergraduate institution. So I'm crying and crying. You can imagine a 16-year-old crying. All the tears are coming down. And my mother said, uh, just give it another week. What a recipe she gave me. So <laughs> here I go back uh, one more week. And next Saturday, I go back. It's the same rainy, gloomy night. And I take the six-hour bus ride and I go to New Delhi again. And my mother is not there. She has gone with her brother somewhere. And uh, I'm just sitting there at the porch of the rented house, which my uncle had. And I'm sitting there for two hours, three hours. And I'm about to go back. But I'm saying, no, no, i got to see my mother and start crying again. Uh, so she comes uh, late, about three hours later. And I start crying again and all this kind of stuff. And my mother is um, saying, what the heck am I going to do with this guy? So after a while, here's my mother, who's the eldest of seven children. She had to drop out of middle school because her mother got tuberculosis. So she was, since she was the eldest in the family, so she had to drop out of school and take care of the rest of the children in the house. So she couldn't give me this spill about, hey, when I was in college, this happened and that happened, and this, I did this and I did that. What was she going to say? So suddenly, something came out of her mouth. It was just two sentences. It was... Uh, uh, she said, Pupu, that was my, uh, uh, that was my uh, uh, what's it called, nickname. She said, it's your life. You decide. And that's all she said. So I'm glad she said that. So here are my graduate days. So what happened is after I graduated uh, from uh, Bits Plani in 1981, I was a very much a patriotic guy. I wanted to stay in India solve India's problems and do all kinds of good stuff. But the bitterness which my father faced from time to time because of being honest, not giving bribes, not taking bribes, that was coming into me. And I really didn't want to follow that bitterness. I wanted to go to a place where social justice is at least practiced. I know that some of you might believe that social justice is not practiced in the United States because of some singular event which might have taken place in your life. But it does happen. I think that... Um, United States is one of the few countries where social justice is practiced and it is giving us big rewards as such. So I wanted to go to a place where social justice is practiced, not 
to a place of opportunity or a place of milk and honey or anything like that. I was just wanting to see that if I do something, that there'll be some reward on the end. Life is not fair, but most of the time, that it would be fair. So I applied to all different schools and I finally ended up in Clemson uh, University in South Carolina. Any Clemson Tigers here except for my department chair? Yeah, yeah, go Tigers. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I went to Clemson. And there was not enough money for, uh, my parents didn't have enough money for the airline ticket and also for the initial fees which had to be paid. My mother had a little bit of gold. She wanted to sell it, but it was not still enough money. But my uncle came to my rescue, was my uh, mother's sister's husband, and he took a loan against his uh, retirement fund and uh, took out the money enough for the airline, airline fees as well as the initial fees which I had to pay. So what I'm here trying to say is that if you are trying to think that uh, I'm a self-made man, that's not my story. I have gotten help all along the way from other people. I don't know how many people who say they are self-made that somebody has not helped them somewhere, maybe not monetarily, but in terms of some kind of encouragement or in some terms of giving them a break or something like that. So I graduated in 1987 and I ended up at USF. So this is my family, this is my wife, Sherry. We've been married for 28 years. This is our photo from the day we got married outside the court in Greenville, South Carolina. So we have, been, we have seen our ups and downs. We have had some good times, some bad times, maybe more than what other people have had. Uh, but I think we have come stronger on the end. I don't want to tell a reductive story here, but it has been tough uh, sometimes. And sometimes it has been very joyous because I'm so happy. The rest of the family is here. That's Candice. Uh, Candice went to uh, University of South Florida. She did a mass comm degree. And um, she's right there, Candice. Yeah, yeah. And she works for the College of Arts. Uh, so if you have seen any of those videos uh, or trailers uh, or pictures from uh, College of Arts for dance or theater, um, she's most probably the one who has made those. Now, our other daughter is Anjali. Uh, she uh, graduated with an anthropology degree. Don't tell the governor that. Um, and she has put it to good use, and she's in the armed forces. I cannot go anything beyond that. Let me tell you about a crazy idea I had in 1991. I was here at USF. I had been here for about four years. And I was teaching this course called Numerical Methods. And students would ask me all these questions, say, Dr. Carr, what will happen if something changes, will it become less, will it become more, or something like that. And uh, I, would have, I would not be able to readily answer those questions just like many other people are able to do so because you have to write computer programs to be able to figure out what's going to happen. So I had this crazy idea that what I'm going to do is I'm going to write, start writing programs uh, based on these student questions and I'll be able to then able to answer them readily. And then I also thought that, hey, maybe I'm not the only person, only numerical methods instructor in the nation or in the world who's being asked these questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send these programs uh, on these 1.44 megabyte disks. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember those, but uh, th those were God sent after those 3.5 inch uh, floppy disks. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so I, I wrote a proposal to National Science Foundation. I said, hey, uh, can you give me some money because it's taking me a lot of time to make these simulations. I will write a book also. I'll write multiple choice questions. It'll be almost like a courseware. It was unheard of at that time that somebody's going to develop a full courseware. And they said, oh, we've got a great proposal and all this stuff, but we cannot fund it because at that time, the emphasis was on hardware-based education as opposed to software-based education. So I didn't get any money. Next year, we applied again, didn't get the money. Then in 2000, uh, suddenly MIT uh, suggested that, hey, we should have open courseware initiative. So they started putting up these courses on the internet. Internet had become quite, uh, quite a regular phenomena in our day-to-day -day life. So we applied again to National Science Foundation. It was myself, uh, uh, Glenn Besterfield, uh, uh, who's in who's the charge of INTO program, and Jim Eisen from College of Education. So we wrote this proposal, and it got rejected again. So my idea had not become any better in the last 10 years or so. But I'm not the one to give up especially when I got a crazy idea. I gi I've given up on many things. You got to know how to give up, when to give up also. So, but I didn't want to give up on this crazy idea. 
So I said, hey, 2001, so I asked Dr. Besserfield and Dr. Eisen, hey, let's go and do it again. It doesn't hurt. And they funded it us. And ever since then, we have been funded continuously since till 2016, although we have gotten a number of rejections in the meanwhile. So please don't think it has been a linear path going through this uh, process. Now, this particular course which we have developed, uh, we get about uh, 1 million views per year. Students from all over the world, about 150 different countries, watch the YouTube videos. We get about a million, pay, million views of the YouTube videos also. So it's a pretty popular website, and uh, it, has, it, has, it has done very well. I'm, I'm very pleased with it that hey, it is helping students, not just in the United States, but also throughout, uh, throughout the world. But again, I'm going to tell you that this is not something which I have done alone. So many times people might think that, hey, I'm the numerical guy or something like that or the numerical methods guy, but I have had help from other people. Uh, when one of our uh, investigators uh, uh, resigned from University of South Florida, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Yalchin here, uh, he stepped in and said, hey, okay, I'll go ahead and do the evaluation of the project itself. And since then, he has molded the way we assess our results for numerical methods in many, many different ways I had never thought of. So, uh, or even, uh, or not even, I should say, or also my department chair, Dr. Dubey, who's right here, for always entertaining my crazy ideas. He's never told me once that, hey, what the heck are you talking about? He said, just go for it. Uh, so I have had help all over the place. So let's, uh, let's do some, let's just talk about what students think about me. So as I told you that I have this, uh, we have one million views of the YouTube videos. I got 10,000 subscribers to the Numerical Methods Guy channel. And they send me all kinds of good comments. It makes my day or night, depending on whether I'm awake at 3, 3 a.m. at night. So this is what they say. Oh, they say best channel ever. That's even better than all the cat channels and the makeup channels. I feel, I feel terrific that these guys are able to say that. Hey, it's the best channel ever. And the brilliant te teaching technique and all kinds of good stuff and makes my head grow big. And then I got my own USF students. They take me down, take me down to it. <laughs> uh, this is what they say. This is just a glimpse of it. They even told me that I run a sweatshop. Quiz every day, test every other week, something like that. They make Kathy Lee Gifford look like goddess or something like that. But I've learned quite a bit from my USF students. I've been here for 28 years. Many of them are right here. They have learned, they taught me humility. I see a lot of students uh, in the college who have received quite a number of accolades. But again, I see that they, it doesn't go to their head. They just accept it. They say, okay, somebody has recognized us. or We've done well in the test. They just take it in stride. I learned about grace. I've seen students uh, who are taking care of their mother who has Alzheimer's, taking care of the children who is chronically sick, or sometimes even have a terminal disease themselves. But never have they told me that, hey, I need a break because of that. Only if it has become certain that, hey, they cannot do it, they have come to me and asked me that if I can give them a break and if I can sign a late drop or something like that. But most of the times, the grace they have maintained just blows me away. <laughs> well, there's a lot of optimism in USF students. And that optimism is as follows. Hey, I got this project due the day after spring break, but I can go to the Bahamas for the whole spring break. <laughs> and most of the times it works. So I don't know how they do it. Maybe they come on Sunday night and do the project. But the other thing, the last thing which I have learned is keeping my mouth shut when needed. And this is the work still in progress, guys. So I know that uh, last lecture is supposed to mean that I'm supposed to give some advice here, some wise advice. And the reason why I consider myself an ordinary man, because I'm a man with flaws just like anybody else. 
I don't want to be put on a pedestal of any nature as such. I'm already finding out that my family and friends are already nodding their heads in agreement that I'm a man with flaws. But I plan not to use my opinions as they will be just one data point, as my friend Dr. Yalchin would say. That if you just say in your opinion, that's just one data point. So it's not telling you something else. So what I want to do is I want to tell you what the experts are saying. Those people who spend their whole lives trying to look at certain things which they are, which, which is a part of our life. So that's what I'm going to do today, so far as the advice is concerned. The first one is work ethic. In the case of the work ethic, you got to work hard and smart. And that work hard and smart means wax on, wax off, guys. There is no substitute to wax on, wax off. Many times people think that I'm going to take the easy way out, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to ask my friend. But eventually you have to do the wax on, wax off. You might think that some of the assignments which uh, our teachers are giving to you are there of wax on, wax off style. That, hey, what is this going to do to me? The thing is that you will realize it maybe while you are getting educated or when you go to the, to the workplace that, hey, those wax on, wax off assignments work for a certain reason. Think of school as a boot camp. That's the best way to think of uh, school. It's a boot camp for your real life, not only to get you ready for the career, but also to make you a good citizen. I look at the university education as more of making a good citizen as opposed to getting you ready for the corporate life. But it has turned the other way around. That's unfortunate, but that's part of our times. We cannot do anything about it. Now, I know that some of you might be too young for wax on, wax off, so I put this on. So I think some, some, some people are saying, oh, I get it now. Uh, but the thing is that what has, been, what, what has happened is that they made it even more difficult for the millennial generation. They've added two more steps. It's not just wax on, wax off, or jacket on, jacket off. It's jacket on, jacket off, throw it to the ground, pick it up. That's my new rap song, guys. So if anybody who is in the millennial generation here, somebody is telling you, hey, you guys are uh, no good generation or something like that, people have been complaining about that all the time, guys. Even since the Middle Ages, oh, this next generation is going to take us down the tube. Some of them have, but I don't believe that the current generation <laughs> is going to do so. But one of the things which I have realized over the years is that I find more people somehow delaying their adolescence, they're extending their adolescence into their late 20s. And that's an unfortunate thing because the kind of energy which you have in your 20s, you're not going to have the same energy in your 30s or 40s. It'll be a different kind of energy. I'm not saying that you'll have less energy or more energy. I'm all saying that it'll be a different kind of energy which you're going to have. In your, which you have in your 20s. So don't waste it by simply delaying your adolescence into the late 20s. There's a noted psychologist by Meg Jay. She gave a TED talk that 30 is not the new 20s, in which she mentions the fact that uh, uh, eight out of 10, so let me, let me rephrase it. The, the, the major experiences which you're going to have in your life, the major aha moments you're going to have in your life, the major decisions you're going to make in your life, if you add them all up, 8 out of 10 of those, 80% of those, you will make them before the age of 35. So by pushing what you were supposed to do in your 20s into 30s, like finding a partner, having kids, uh, uh, finding a career, uh, making a home base, if you push it into your 30s, it's doable. I'm not saying that, hey, we are all done now, but it's doable, but it becomes much harder. So I'm hoping that you will take my advice there, that you will at least plan. It's not necessarily people, some people don't have kids, some people don't get married, that's all right. That's, that's something which is your choice. But at least you should plan what you have to do in order that it doesn't become a big burden for you as you go. Don't be a pimp all your life, guys. <laughs> Time and again, I find that people, they want to be a pimp. They want to, they are given some work, and they just want to give it to somebody else. You do it. And it's not going to, it's not going to do you any good. You got to get your hands dirty, at least for a while. Maybe once you start becoming older, then you know how to, you still should know how to delegate at any age. But the thing is that you got to make your hands dirty. You got to get your hands dirty in order to learn the craft which you want to become an expert in. If you look at anybody, whether it's the Beatles, whether it is, um, uh, Bill Gates, whether it is Steve Jobs, they got their hands dirty. They wrote the code. For example, Steve Jobs and 
Bill Gates, uh, the Beatles were playing in bars three shows a day. So you cannot simply look at the reductive stories, hey, Steve Jobs was the CEO of Apple, or he came up with the iPad. You got to look at the back stories to see that how these people went to that particular level. Now, you got to understand that some people say, oh, okay, I want to be a pimp, but you know that it's a hard life for a pimp out there. The big question today is, what is the biggest hindrance to learning? Uh, I've been doing research uh, with other colleagues of mine on learning for the last now 15 years or so. And what I'm finding out the biggest hindrance to learning is multitasking. I know that some of you might say, hey, what the heck does Dr. Kav know? He's 54 years old. He's not of our times. He's from a different time. We, would, we were also doing multitasking when we were your age. When we were studying in the park, if a nice looking girl went by, we would see her. So that was multitasking. So multitasking has been there all the time. But the kind of multitasking I'm talking about is when you have to concentrate on things. Those are the times when you should not be multitasking. If you are folding towels and watching TV, talking to your friend or talking to your family member, that's not the kind of multitasking I'm talking about. Those people have been doing that for a long time. It's because the different part of the brain is being used for that. This is an example of what happened yesterday. Somebody who was texting and driving and hit one of our students on the back. Now, if I asked you how many of you text and drive, I hope that nobody raises their hand. The reason why people will say, no, I don't text and drive, is because the consequences are immediate. Your brain is going to register that, hey, if I go ahead and text and drive, I'm going to have an accident, I might hurt somebody, I might get hurt myself, and so on and so forth. So you are able to at least magnify those consequences in your brain. But when you say that, hey, somebody is drinking heavily every day, or maybe he is smoking two packs of cigarette every day, or maybe eating a little bit too much every day, you can very well see that the consequences are not immediate. So when those consequences are immediate, we're not able to register that, hey, it's not good for us. So when you're multitasking, let's suppose you are reading a book, also doing your homework, also texting somebody, doing something else, the consequences are not immediate. So you're not able to register in your brain. So we have to make a conscious effort of figuring out uh, whether we should, be we should be multitasking or not. There are two circuits in the brain. There are many other circuits. I'm not saying there are only two circuits. So there are two circuits in the brain which I want to talk to you about. The first circuit is the one for the reactive attention. That's the stratum, which is right here on the right side. That's the part of the brain which you use for doing procedural stuff, like learning how to drive or learning how to bike. But imagine how much time does it take you to learn how to bike, how much time it takes you to learn to drive. So that's the part which is the reactive. Or somebody comes behind you and says, that, Oof. that's the part of the brain which is going to get activated. But the part of the brain which needs to get activated for when you are concentrating on something is the hippocampus. So if you are multitasking, it's not that part of the brain which is getting activated, it's this part of the brain which is getting activated. That's, your, that's why your learning is going to be shallow. Look at this young lady there. She is texting, she's reading a book, she's on the computer. I don't know what else she is doing. David Meyer of University of Virginia, he's a noted researcher in multitasking. And University of Michigan, not Virginia, University of Michigan. And he talks about four consequences, negative consequences of doing college work while multitasking. The first one is time spent. If you are multitasking while you're doing college work, you do have to go from one task to another. It's going to take you some time to get re-familiarized with what you were doing in the first place. So you are spending actually more time doing your college work than if you were not multitasking. The second one is mental fatigue. What mental fatigue simply means is that you might be still doing two tasks of the same nature. So let's suppose you are texting somebody and you are also writing a laboratory report. They are both writing assignments as such, right? But the thing is that when you're texting somebody, you can use LOL, OMG, all kinds of good stuff. It's an informal language which you're going to use. 
But when you are writing a laboratory technical report, that requires a very formal writing to be done. Now, what's going to happen is that because you are going back and forth between those two, uh, those two activities, it's going to create a mental fatigue because different parts of the brain are being used for those two activities. The third one is memory failure, which not a lot of people understand about what it means memory failure. If you're in a test and suddenly you're not able to recall something, it's not because you're multitasking while you are taking a test. During a test, everything is off. But what has happened is that when you are multitasking and you are trying to read for your test, it got encoded in a different fashion. So when you're multitasking, when you're reading, when you're multitasking, the encoding in the brain is of a different nature than if you are not multitasking. So you might blame that, hey, there is uh, something wrong that I did study for this test and I'm not able to do it. It's because it got encoded the wrong way. And the fourth one is that your higher order learning is going to suffer. The National Academy of Sciences published a paper in which they took two groups of students and they gave the same, same reading assignment to the two groups of students. In one group, there, were, there was no multitasking, no distractions. In the other one, the only thing which they had to do was sound tones will come intermittently and they had to count them. They wanted to make sure that the people are getting distracted rather than simply ignoring the sound tones. So they wanted to, them to count them. And they gave them a test afterwards and said, hey, go ahead and take a test and let's see how well you perform. Both groups performed equally well. And right at that time, you might think that, hey, so there's nothing wrong with multitasking. They gave them another test where they had to do higher order thinking, what you might be knowing as critical thinking, where you have supposed to apply, synthesize, and evaluate uh, information. In that case, what happened was the multitasking people had a lot more trouble in relating what they had learned to another context as opposed to non-multitasking ones. Finance 101. So let me talk about money. I think everybody is worried about money, but some people will tell you that money is not important. And the reason why they will tell you money is not important, because they all have it. And it's not because they have it, that's why they're telling you that hey, money is not important. It's because they have moved on. Money has become second nature to them. Just like if you don't think twice about where your square meal a day is gonna come from, you don't, you don't think about it every day. Now, Poverty is glamorized only in movies made in India, the Bollywood movies. Glamorized quite a bit. And even Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling uh, said this about poverty. You know her rags to riches story. Poverty entails fear and stress and sometimes depression. It meets a thousand pity, humiliations, and hardships. Climbing out of poverty by your own efforts, that's something you want to pride yourself. But poverty itself is romanticized by fools. I hope that you won't romanticize poverty, that you will try to see that, hey, that money is important. Yeah, of course, you cannot do it at the sacrifice of your health, of your relationships, and things like that. You have to make that decision, but don't make it to be a small part of your life. Now, you don't have to go as far as Kesha, for example, putting a dollar sign in her name. What I heard last, last month, that she came out of rehab and dropped a dollar sign. Is that true? Yes, that's true. So she has dropped that dollar sign. So even she knows that you don't have to go as far as that. Another group of people who will tell you that money is not important is the people who confuse that money is not important with that money is the only thing. Even in the Bible, Timothy chapter 6 says that, doesn't say that, hey, the root of all evils is money. It says the, the, the love of money is the root of all evils. So you've got to differentiate between the two. This was an old saying which my professor at Clemson University, Dr. Ball, would say that if you want a job, you got to convince the employer that, hey, he can make money out of you. So if you are able to do that, I think you have a job. And many times you might find out that, hey, um, I'm not able to make the proper decision about money. So all you have to think about is PMS. Susie Arman, who's a financial guru, I like her very much, at least I liked her very much at one point. And she talks about that whenever you have to make a decision about money and you don't know what to do, you should think about, she doesn't say think about PMS, she says think about this. 
People first, money next, stuff last. So if you take care of that, I think you should be in good shape. Marriage 101, right? Is everybody getting married here? Yes? There was this old philosopher, I don't know what his name was, and somebody asked him, should I marry at all? And do you know what he said? He said, by all means marry. And this is also what he said. <laughs> now I know that everybody is looking, if, if you are with your spouse or your partner, they are, they're looking at each other, hey, are you happy or are you a philosopher? So I'll let you decide that when you go home. Some people might say, hey, I'm going to just simply marry well. I don't need to do anything. I'll just marry some super rich guy or super rich girl. And that's all going to take care of. So the question is, what if I marry a trophy spouse? The answer is as follows. Nowadays, with everybody getting participation trophies, please ask them what the trophy was for. Uh, let's look at lessons in marriage. An article written in Atlantic by Kristen Gross Lowe just two months ago reminds us that marriage will affect all aspects of your life. And divorce is the second most stressful event in, your, in, in somebody's life. So the thing is that we have to take marriage seriously if that's what we want to be, want to be doing. I know that some people call divorce unconscious coupling, but please don't look at marriage as uh, conscious uncoupling. Uh, what is it called? Divorce is looked as conscious uncoupling, right? Conscious uncoupling, but don't look at marriage as unconscious coupling. So you got to uh, take, it with, uh, take it with some, uh, think, really think hard about it. The first myth which I want to bust about marriage, or at least in this article which it says, is that we all think that we have soulmates. There are no soulmates, guys. As much as you would like to believe that there are soulmates, uh, it's not the truth. You might think that you have a soulmate sitting next to you, most probably because you just fell in love and everything is hazy with hormones. Or you might be sitting with somebody who has been your partner for a while, and what you are going to find out is that that soulmate which you are calling your partner is actually an earned title, not something which automatically happened. So there are several, uh, several of these um, uh, lessons which are in this course called Marriage 101, which is taught at Northwestern University, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about. The first uh, uh, lesson is called self-understanding, that your mission in marriage should not be to find the right partner, but to make the right person to be yourself. If you are not able to attract the right person, that means that you got to work on yourself. The second one is that you cannot avoid marital conflict. No matter how much people say we never fight, then next day I find them to be divorced. So that has come as a surprise to me. But it doesn't mean that go, ahead and go home today and pick up a fight with your partner because you have not fought for a long time. Conflict should not be looked at as a win-lose situation, but something as that, hey, let me go ahead and see that uh, uh, how we can resolve the problem. A good marriage takes skill. As much as we like to think that in our culture, American culture especially, that uh, good marriage automatically happens, it does require work. It doesn't have to be work like work itself, but you have to consciously think about what you can do for another person. You and your partner do need similar worldviews. As much as we like to think that opposites attract, uh, you'll find out that you're going to have a lot more problems if you are opposite in nature. You do need to have a similar worldview. I'm not saying you have the same worldview, but a similar worldview. It's quite possible that's why ChristianMingle.com might be one of the most uh, successful online sites, because at least in, in the respect of religion, they have the same worldview. Work-life balance. Everybody talks about work-life balance. It's very hard, guys. No matter how much people will tell you that I have achieved work-life balance, it's very hard. Sometimes you will have it. I'm not saying that you'll never have work-life balance. You'll have work-life balance sometimes, and, and in some of those times, you won't have it in the proportion you want. And also, your idea about work-life balance is going to change as time goes by. 
you find out that uh, when you're single, when you're dating, when you're getting married, when you're having kids, when your kids are out of the nest, those, uh, those work-life balance is going to change. And one of the things which Nigel Marsh talks about is that you can elongate the time frame by which you measure your work-life balance. That's one way of making this work-life balance a little bit, uh, a little bit acceptable to you. For example, somebody might say, hey, I want to have work-life balance every day. I want to have dinner with my family every day. It's almost impossible for most of us to have dinner with our family every day. But if somebody tells his boss that, hey, at 5 o'clock I'm punching my clock no matter what, what's going to happen is that if you are one of those guys who's going to punch the clock at 5 o'clock every day, tomorrow if your son has a recital at 12 noon, most probably your boss is not going to think good of you that, hey, you're the one who punches the clock every day at 5 o'clock. So we have to look at work-life balance not on a daily basis, but at least on a weekly basis so that our time frame is a little bit elongated. What that does is that we have the weekend, we have the nights, we have the evenings, we have Friday nights, we have all these different days available and we don't have to necessarily do each and everything every day to be able to at least get a, get a feeling that we have work-life balance. Nigel Marsh should know because he wrote a book called Fat, Fat 40 and Fired. And his second book was Overworked and Underlaid. <laughs> Communication. If you survey any of the employers, four things or three things come to the top for employers when they want to hire men, what kind of deficiencies they see. One is to that, hey, our students do not have good verbal and uh, written communication. The second one is team, teamwork or team skills. And third one is problem solving. For our engineers and scientists, they also include data analysis as the fourth item which, uh, on which they, they are supposed to be working on. So this is coming from me. I made all A's and B's in my undergraduate when I was at Bits Plani. But these are three C's I made. English one, English two, English three. It took me a while. When I first came to USF, I wrote proposals left and right for the first five years. None of them got funded. And when I was showing it to people, they were very nice to me. They say, hey, your ideas are great, but there's something missing. And they wouldn't tell me. So the something missing was because I was not able to write. So what I did was, uh, with the help of my wife, who reads voraciously, uh, she said, you go ahead and go ahead and simply write. Write anything. You don't have to show it to anybody. Just start writing. So I started writing like crazy, and I will write, and I'll throw it away, write again, throw it away. Then at the age of 38, I got my first article published in Tampa Tribune. I was, I was so happy. And uh, since then, uh, I've been writing proposals and things like that, and it looks like that I have gotten the hang of it. But if you really want to improve your communication, it's not just enough to read books, but you got to be in the writing mode. You can show your writing to your partner or to your family members or just read it and just put it, in a, put it in a file somewhere. That's the best way to improve your writing. I had to put this in there. Don't believe everything this guy says uh, for some reason. It is irrelevant to my presentation here because of this fact. Too many liberals in the house? We've got to talk about happiness 101. Everybody says, hey, uh, how, how to be happy. So this is the time when my few volunteers are going to come to the stage, and they're going to be happy like crazy. So what are those volunteers, guys? I got, I don't know, I got Laura, Kaya here, another Laura, Christina, Nissa, uh, Rachna, Leonardo. Howard Fox, where are you going? <laughs> are you guys ready? It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. Sunshine, she's here, you can take a break. I'm a hot air balloon that could go to space.
guys, uh, I have a prize for you because I told them that, hey, they're going to get one dollar. And somebody pointed out that, hey, for one minute of dance, they're going to get one dollar. They're sixty dollars an hour. How many jobs are there which pay sixty dollars an hour? Leonardo? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, one more round of applause for my volunteers. <laughs> Guys, as much as we want to talk about the secret of happiness, I'm going to here tell you that there's no secret of happiness. Nobody knows about it. People have written books. One of the, some of the best books are like Stumbling on Happiness uh, by Gilbert, Art of Happiness by Dalai Lama. And, but there are correlational things, which means that, hey, if we look at happy people, what kind of traits do they have? The first trait which you find in the correlation of people is that they have a social network. Not Facebook, guys. They have a social network, which means that where they get together with each other and things like that. Because one of the things which you got to see is that we human beings always want to get connected. No matter as much as we want to think that we can live alone, we want to get connected. That's my mother and sister there in Delhi. I Skype with them about two to three times a week. Uh, they have been a source of encouragement during my days of despair and also sh sharing my moments of joy throughout the time I have been here in the United States. Also have my tea buddies, Dr. Yalchin and Dr. Dubey here. We go for tea sometimes at Starbucks. You might have seen us there. We have solved all world's problems, guys. And then I also have my walking buddy, Fred, here. And we talk about faith and living all the time. We have not solved any of those problems either. But one of the things which you got to understand with the social network is that social network cannot be all about gossiping and complaining. As you found out that people who are happy, yes, they spend a lot of time together with other people. They might gossip a little bit for five, 10 minutes. They might complain about their life or somebody else's life for five, 10 minutes. But the rest of the conversation is on substantial things. It can be politics, religion, whatever topic you want to, you want to raise. The second aspect of happy people is they have love. Some kind of additional, uh, unconditional love from somebody. It doesn't have to be from all the people in the world. I've seen too many people who seek love from where none is to be given. And that's going to simply add to your sadness. So just if you have even a single person who's going to give you some unconditional love or is giving you unconditional love, consider yourself to be lucky. Good health, that's an automatic thing about being happy. Of course, many of us have chronic conditions, especially when we get older, but it's all about the attitude which we have towards that chronic condition to see that how we deal with it. The last, the most important part is empathy. If you look at people, as I talk to different people about if, they, if I think that they are happy, they say love and empathy are the two things which keeps them grounded and keeps them happy. Now, what is empathy all about? Empathy has three levels. The first one is the cognitive level. The cognitive level is simply where you understand what the other person is going through. You understand what the other person's distress is. That's the cognitive level. The second level is the one which is emotional, that where if a doctor is giving bad news to a patient, that he also starts crying. So you're basically able to feel the pain or the distress which the other person is feeling, you're feeling the same kind of emotions as the person which is happening to. But what we have to do is we have to go to the next level, which is the compassionate level. All these ideas are coming from two books which I would like you to read by Daniel Goldman. One is Emotional Intelligence, and the second one is Focus, which he just came up with recently. Emotional Intelligence was written in 1990 or so. And it's the compassionate level where people talk about that, hey, that's the one which you should be practicing. Of course, you have to go through the first two levels to be able to get to the compassionate level. The compassionate level is where if somebody's in distress, that you do something about it. If somebody's car breaks down, you give them a ride. If somebody's parent falls sick, you take care of the child. If somebody's struggling in math in the neighborhood, you help them, you tutor them. So those compassionate things are what's going to make you happy. Now the question is that, uh, I get asked this question many a times, is college worth it? All I'm going to say is again correlational. 95% of the CEOs 
of Fortune 500 companies have a college degree. 70% of those CEOs also have an advanced degree such as MBA. It's all correlation. I'm not saying that, hey, just because they went to college that they ended up as a CEO, but you can make your own judgments about that. But there is this other guy which I came to know through YouTube who says that he can reduce the college rather than from four years to five minutes, and you only got to pay $20. I'm sure that you're interested in that, right? So let's go and see what this guy has to say. I find that education, I think it don't matter where you go to school, Italy, America, Brazil, it's all the same. It's all just memorization. And it don't matter how long you can remember anything, just so you can parrot it back for the test. And I got this idea for a school I would like to start. Something called the Five Minute University. <laughs> and the idea is that in five minutes, you learn what the average college graduate remembers five years after he or she's out of the school. <laughs> would the cost of like $20. <laughs> That might seem like a lot of money, $20 just for five minutes. But that's for like a tuition, <laughs> cap and a gown a rental, <laughs> graduation a picture, snacks, everything. Everything included. You know, like in college, you have to take a foreign language. Well, at the five-minute university, you can have your choice. Any language you want, you can take it. Say if you want to take a Spanish, what I teach you is, Como esta usted? That means, how are you? And the answer is muy bien, means very well. And believe me, if you took two years of college Spanish, five years after you're out of school, como esta usted muy bien, about all you're going to remember. <laughs> so in my school, that's all you learn. You see, you don't have to waste your time with the conjugations, vocabulary, all that junk. You just forget it anyway, and what's the difference? <laughs> Economics, supply, and demand. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Business, businesses, you buy something and you sell it for more. <laughs> theology, I'm going to have a theology department, you know, since I'm a priest, it's only right. And what you have to learn in theology is the answer to the question, where is God? And the answer is, God is everywhere. <laughs> Why? Because he likes you. <laughs> That's a kind of a combination of the Disney and Roman Catholic philosophy. <laughs> just, it's just a perfect for the late 70s or early 80s, you know? Just a perfect. Well, after the courses are all over, then it's a time for a little Easter vacation. No time to go to Fort Lauderdale. Only lasts like 20 seconds. But what I do for you, I like to turn on a sun lamp. You know, I give you a little glass of orange juice. That's the snack part, orange juice. And then after vacation, you know, after you swallow it real quick, then it's a time for the final exams. I say to you, como esta usted? You say muy bien. Whereas God, the God is everywhere, economics is supply and demand. Then I put on your cap and a gown. I get out to my Polaroid the camera, you know, make a little snap a flash of picture for you. I give you the picture, you give me twenty dollars, I give you a diploma, and your college graduate ready to go. And I'm not I'm not too sure, but I'm pretty sure, right next door to the Five Minute University, I might have opened up a little law school. <laughs> you know, you got another minute? <laughs> so then I want to tell you I'm, I've been blessed by you being coming here, but you have carved out a big amount of your time driving here and being here listening to what I have to say, even if you don't agree with me, that's fine. But I would like you to stay in touch with me. You can watch me on YouTube as much as you want. You can become a subscriber. But you're only going to learn numerical methods, guys. This is my official website. 
That's my email. That's the best way to get in touch with me. You can become my Facebook friend. I've opened it to everyone, not just friends of friends at this time. So the next two days, uh, you can become my Facebook friend. Am I going to get any new ones? Yes? OK. You, you get a special joke every day. You can be my Twitter friend. You can phone me. See, I'm so impressed with you guys. I feel like as if I'm your best friend. I'm even going to give you my cell number. But the best way to see me is face to face. ENC 2215 in the third engineering building, engineering building number three. Thank you so much. And I wish that your life is as good as your Facebook status updates, guys. Thank you.